Were you good at math? Were? I'm still as good as math as I ever was. Not very. <laughs> <laughs> so that's two of us in the same boat. Hmm. Why are we asking this question? Because we're talking numbers today, na? Welcome to this connect. Uh, you'll see what we are on about in just a moment. Karthik, twenty something years in the business, so you've seen a lot of spec sheets, big number, right? So let's not focus on that. You were at your previous organization for what? Six years. Yeah. How many spec sheets do you think you saw in those six years? I think in a year, easy a hundred. So that's about six hundred spec sheets. But Jig, yeah. Was it fun? Well, to me, kind of. It's a. I look at it as a piece of a puzzle, and mm. that's one piece. It gives you clues. It can throw you off, and I guess that's the interesting part about spec sheets, right? Yeah. So, what do you think is more likely to happen? Since you're clearly, wait, wait, you got to say your line. Which one? About spec sheets. Oh, they all know the line already. I, I say don't pay attention to spec sheets. They are only going to mislead you. They don't mean anything in the real world. You don't write spec sheets. I'll tell you why. Uh, A dominar is like 180 kilos, and if you think about it, there's a whole bunch of 600 cc class motorcycles which are also 180 kilos. Yeah. So it makes the dominar look very heavy for what it is. But are you going to carry that carry that bike around? And if you're not, then, and I'm not saying the 180 doesn't have various implications on economy and performance. Does it matter? Exactly. How much does it matter? I think that is the thing that gets really interesting. Why spec sheets by themselves Correct. are not enough? They are just they are maybe they put you in the ballpark of what the experience could be, but not necessarily very accurately. That is what that is that is what I'm saying. Like looking at spec sheets used to be like it gives you an idea or a suggestion of what could be, mm. but not necessarily what it is. So give me an example of one motorcycle or car that stands out for you, which definitely did not do what the spec sheet said. Right, and then followed by one that definitely did a far better job than the spec sheet promised. Okay, so I think one is a very close to home example, right? The Busa, two hundred seventy kilograms, right? Two hundred sixty-eight, and everybody looks at that number and freaks out, and uh, as did I. Right? I was like, dude, this is just too much. And my first experience with the Busa was in the city, and when I was not a very experienced rider, all of that. So it wasn't a very uh, happy uh, relationship at that point in time, and then there was this one time when you know Suzuki was doing the Jigsa Cup, and Suresh Babu, and he the first time around he told me go ride the Busa, at Kari, Kari, not right. even MMRT, right? And I think at that point of time that Kari track was at its worst I've ever seen. It was bumpy in two or three important places, and it was a difficult track at that point of time. Right. So just to set context, Kari is the race track we have in Coimbatore, right? And it's a narrower, twistier, tighter kind of track. So for a bigger, heavier motorcycle, not as friendly. Yeah, you'd be in first gear for a large part of it, second maybe, and yeah. then one part of the circuit where you get to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, depending on how fast you're going. But yeah, it's a first gear track on most fast machines. And uh, so the second second season, I was there again when the Jixi Cup was starting off, right? And this time, Suresh said, "You can't leave until you ride the bike." That's the silver and the blue bike. That no, that was the red and silver. Red and silver bike. Okay. So he, there were two bikes. There yeah. were two bikes. I, I rode the red and silver, and uh, he said, "You can't." I said, "I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it." And he said, "No, you have to ride it." And so I went out, and I think that's for me the penny drop moment mm. when the spec sheet stopped being. Whatever it was, and the motorcycle, so to speak, came into its own. It came alive, right? And there's this photograph that I love from there, which Aditya Bedre shot, right? And I didn't even realize I was. I mean, I had, I had really like kind of leaned the bike over, and I didn't. I was just like, no, I want to be careful. I want to be safe. And I come back, and he's like, what nonsense are you talking about? I said, no, dude, it's such a heavy bike. I don't want to crash it. He's like, one second. <laughs> right? And that's where, for me, like the fascination with the Busa, I think that was the tipping point of sorts. Mm. So I think that is a great example um, of a bike that oh, outperforms its spec sheet. Absolutely. What is an example of a motorcycle or car that you said, "Oh, nice spec sheet," or something like that, and then you drove it, and then you're like, "Huh." So I think one example that I have in the car world, uh, very clearly in my head, is like when we went with the when downsizing the trend started, mm. right? When we started going from Uh, larger naturally aspirated engines to um, 
smaller turbos. turbocharged engines and one standout engine of course globally has been the EcoBoost the 1 liter that's and the Ford EcoBoost that's the Ford EcoBoost yeah absolutely so and it, it came in the EcoSport and it was a technological marvel in terms of its size weight power to s- displacement and all of that and fantastic but to me that engine was just not right for india hmm. right whatever it promised on paper i don't think it it could deliver that in our environment in our condition so it's also which is why you know the spec sheet is one thing does it fit you does it fit your life does it fit your environment these are the things that you really have to look at and work with right so the eco boost great engine hmm. but was it the right engine for most people here in india no i think most of the times back then they had they had a fantastic diesel so i would by and large i would tell people just buy just buy the diesel it's mm. okay don't don't worry about it i know that's the latest greatest so to speak but no i think you're better off with the diesel right so i think that's clearly for me go um wow there are so many bikes that regularly underperform their spec sheets but let's start at the positive end of it because you did too So when we saw the radar spec sheet for the first time the TVS radar is it an impressive spec sheet hmm for the segment if you think about it it's the usual TVS 5% more than everything kind hmm. of spec sheet hmm. right? and you're like TVS is trying another direction or attempt at another commuter right, right. it's not a very exciting spec sheet to see from hmm. that perspective right and we've seen tvs try their hand at victor and phoenix and god mm. knows what all mm. so it's it's okay right then you ride it mm. and then i like oh wow this bike is so much fun mm. and i remember that when i go to tvs <clears throat> my reputation over time has become that i will be the first journalist in gear mm. and i will be physically hauled off the motorcycle at the end of every single one of mm. these events because now i will definitely miss my flight mm. and it happened on the radar too mm. but on the radar the end talk and a couple of other machines i remember mm. i was laughing my heart out while i was doing this on other machines i was like have i not discovered something about this machine that riding longer will maybe unlock mm. but with the radar it was immediately clear that that spec sheet literally did not hold a candle to the machine it belonged to because it was just a whole different experience and the end talk was yeah. exactly the same right yeah. the scooty zest in fact I mean how dull is that spec sheet and how badly did TVS slot it as a girl scooter when to me the first thing when I said when I wrote it is I'm going to write the pink scooter for the story precisely because I don't think this feels like a girl scooter at all just just so you know like when we went for the TVS scooty pep so I zest the I always mix up pep and zest mm. but scooty zest that scooter people not just us most people were regularly scraping the exhaust shield on that scooter going around the track yeah. uh, that TVS has at Hosur because it was just so much fun you and it had such great handling like i mean we, i remember telling this to uh, talking this uh, i think Cecil was there then mm. and saying like we're talking about a scooter and here we are talking about handling yeah this is bizarre and it's not even like some fancy scooter it's a scooty yeah. right uh, yeah Yeah so when we got to ride that scooter up to Khardungla with the uh, the girls when we did that story for overdrive uh, we I went two times and both times that scooter was amazing to ride mm. and you really felt mm. that it outperformed its spec sheet by absolutely miles right on the other side for example uh, why i think it is possible to get misled uh take the javas for example mm. uh the 334 cc engine Hmm. has decent numbers hmm. uh, if you look at their weights they are okay hmm. if you look at their prices they are good hmm. and if you look at their distribution network all the numeric sides of that picture hmm. they all seem to fall into place hmm. but when you go ride it hmm. you realize that the torque is being made in a way that says the power will be better but when you get to where the power is the refinement is completely gone and that feeling of oh i don't like this refinement is hmm. not going to be captured in a spec sheet right and then you're disappointed right because the spec sheet promised you a world that the motorcycle is not currently able to deliver and i'm saying currently because at least in the javas case i think if they were to spend another 6 months to a year hmm. refining the crap out of that engine i don't see any reason why it couldn't be better i don't know how many <clears throat> statements you let loose in the flow of conversation 
Why would it I say? You guys can rewind that part and just listen to it. Anyways, yeah. The reason why I say this is because over the years of testing, mm. I've come to the conclusion that the more utilitarian a vehicle is, maybe you can get a sense of the utility value of that vehicle from the spec sheet. Mm. So on, it's more critical to say a Splendor buyer or an Activa buyer. Mm. But the moment the abstraction levels become higher, where you're looking mm. for intangibles, mm. it's very difficult. Dude, I'm, I mean, like in cars, one of the most common things, like at uh, Zigweeds and Kardeco, we started doing this, you know, boot space comparison, right? Why? Because boot space, you think about it as, yeah, the number says this. And if that one number is larger than the other. You'll right? get a bigger boot. Right? Not so. Yeah. It's not so, hmm. right? Even those tangible bits are actually, there are so many details that will go into it. It's the shape of the boot, how high it is. What, uh, where do the suspension towers come in and stuff like that, right? How high is it? How deep is it? And all of it affects. And we used to use, I mean, they still do use standardized luggage, right? For all the tests. So it's incredible to see how much you mm. can actually get away with uh, on paper a smaller boot, but right. that's just better designed mm. uh, to give you better practicality to be able to pack more in, just exactly. done more efficiently. Exactly. Right? So I think uh, that is a great example uh, with cars. I think boot space for me hmm. because it's clear cut. Once you experience it, you're like, hey, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right? And the other one for me on motorcycles is uh, seat height. Hmm. You know, we make such a big, I mean, that's a constant conversation. Seat height, seat height, seat height, seat height. Because it presumes how you'll manage the motorcycle. Hmm. But how the motorcycle carries its weight itself hmm. Can make a big difference. Makes a big difference. No, I, I think the seat height conversation is a particularly troublesome conversation for me. Because the moment that number appears on a spec sheet, mm. it draws a line through the rider's community as to this is not for you and this is for you. Mm. Right? Mm. Because if you have a motorcycle with let's say 780 millimeters of seat height, everybody assumes that, oh, this is just going to be easy for anyone to ride. Right. No matter what my height is, I'll manage mm. this. You take that number and stick it at 840. Hmm. And like, because Indians, I think the average height is only 5 foot 7, right? Hmm. So something like 60% of the Indians are like, yeah, I'm not going to be able to ride that. Yeah. But is it actually true? Huh. Don't the shortest of people ride the fastest of motorcycles all the time? Absolutely. It's literally how motorsport works today, where Rossi, for example, was told that your biggest disadvantage is that you're 6 feet tall. Right. And Danny Pedrosa's greatest natural advantage, Mark Marcus's greatest natural advantage, is that they're really tiny human beings. So if you're that short, the seat height discussion is about there's one more thing you need to learn before you become a truly proficient rider. Absolutely. But that seat height number being printed on a spec sheet stops that discussion in its track. And you know the strangest thing? So I get a DM from people like this. Who mm. Say, listen, I'm 4 foot 11, I'm 5 foot 3, I'm 5 foot 4 and... I want to buy the X-Pulse and my friends are telling me it's too tall for me mm. or I'm trying to buy the 390 Adventure and it's too tall for me or whatever. What should I do? You know what I tell them to do? I tell them Google this. Double quotes. Short rider, comma, tall motorcycle, quotes closed. Mm. And what that search shows up is literally thousands of links of short riders telling other short riders how they unlocked the ability to ride a tall motorcycle every day. Right. And the reason for this, and this is why I hate spec sheets so much in some ways, is because you have to just get over one small idea. Hmm. One small thing, which is you need to have two feet on the ground. You don't. Hmm. And that's the first thing every short rider who's figured it out will tell the other guy. Hmm. Right? He's saying, but why are you trying to get both your feet down? It doesn't add like a massive amount of stability. to hmm. it. It's like a small difference. Hmm. So just leave that behind. And as soon as you do, all saddles to stop bothering you so much and if you paint yourself into a corner because of a physical advantage or disadvantage that you have genetically or biologically mm. it's done you have drawn a line that you will never cross uh, there was a story about a friend's dog who was trained not to go out of the room and not to come into the room on command so when the dog was a pup so we were that tall as a dog they put up a fence that was that tall in front of it and they said, you cannot cross that. And the dog learned it. Then the dog became this big. <laughs> and there was a fence still this in front of him. And Toto would sit behind that fence. And you would say, outside the room, he'd go other side of the door right. and sit there. Thinking, I can't cross that fence. It's too tall for me. Right. It never grew out of the mindset. Right. And if you think that a certain motorcycle is too tall for you, you have the exact same mindset. And you can right. change it. Right. 
But I think the other side of the spec sheet, which is more important to me, is often, sometimes even by mistake, motorcycles can become really special because of a way a number of flaws settled in together mm -hmm. and ended up highlighting one great feature of it. Okay. Like if you go to Europe and somebody gives you a 390 Duke to ride, and we both love the 390 Duke, I think it's one of the most amazing motorcycles around for like 12 straight years now or something. Mm. And okay, they said 45 BHP, single cylinder, trellis frame, whatever, whatever. Would you be impressed? In and of itself, in that environment, where there are other machines that do this. Yeah. You would. Mm. But how many times have you gotten off a 390 Duke without being impressed by it? Right? In India, you, the, I can understand why you're impressed. There's nothing else quite like it. And the spec sheet stands out. Mm. But even then, that motorcycle stands out even farther. Yeah. Why do you think that happens? That's what can't be put into the spec sheet. That's what can't be put in the spec sheet because it looks like it's got everything. But the suspension tune is not as stock, the best that it could be. The brakes were not okay for a long time and now they are just about keeping up with that engine. But all the flaws add up to make that performance of the engine feel hmm. so much stronger. Hmm. Right? I remember when the second generation came out, we were all a little disappointed at how mature it felt hmm. and how much better balanced the Duke became. Did it become more useful? Yes. Did it become more usable? Yes. Was it a better tourer because the tank became a 13 and a half liter tank? Yes. But did it feel as special as the mistake filled hmm. generation one from this perspective? Hmm. No, not even close. Hmm. Did I even think about selling that bike off and saying we'll get a Gen 2, it's such a better bike? No, I think the flaws of that bike make it so spectacularly special. Hmm. And there is no way to write a spec sheet that captures that. Actually, I, I will disagree on this front with him because I had the Gen 2 as well. And it had its own set of flaws. In fact, I think the one thing that the first Gen did brilliantly, which again can't be put on a spec sheet, is that it threw a massive safety net around you through a massive safety net with those incredible tires with that slightly slower geometry for the steering. And then you went to the second gen where they went down on tires. You went down from the W's to the H's. So the overall grip was less. The torque on demand went up and they really quickened up the chassis. Mm. Suddenly this became an incredibly fast bike and only people were went up to the 390 Duke singing that, yeah, it, I know what it does, so I'm fine with it. And holy crap, I think yeah. a lot of people got into a lot of trouble with that bike real fast. And then people learned that, hey, I got to back off. This is mm -hmm. not the same machine. On paper, on paper, again, on paper, it seems very similar. But it's not. But it's a completely different motorcycle. And Okay, so I think if by this point, anybody is left in any confusion about this, the spec sheet, I mean... Don't look at it. It doesn't matter. When you see somebody, even within your friends, comparing, saying, I have 45 BHP, you have only 42 BHP. I mean, don't even dignify that with a response because it doesn't matter, I think. So how do you look at a vehicle and how do you get a sense of what is it going to be like? See, I think <coughs> there is no two ways about this. You have to drive and ride. There's nothing else you can do because you can have, you can track from past experience, hmm. other products that a brand may have done or from a particular family. So, uh, give me an example of that, just to clarify. Mm. Now, let's say we are looking at Ford, right? I knew you were going to select Ford for the oh, example. <laughs> well, I know, I shouldn't do that. You should talk about something that we can relate to, right? Um, okay, Let, uh, let's take... Uh, Maruti now, right? Okay. With the 1.2s. Hmm. Now, on paper, it's a very sedate, like normal, like it seems so, it's been around for a long time, the 1.2 liter. It's there in practically everything. There's, hmm. you'd think of it as a humdrum kind of an engine, hmm. right? But that engine is actually so versatile. It's incredible. Hmm. You would just not expect it from that engine, right? It's, Great to drive around every day. It's fun if you decide to rev it up. Mm. And uh, it's really, really smooth. And you look at now with everything. Now you look on paper and say, oh, it's not turbocharged. You know, Oh, the horsepower is not all that great. Now today it should have more horsepower. But the point is that that engine does deliver. Mm. Right? 
So it's always nice to have that surprise. But at the same time, not when you're, as we are seeing with more emission norms and, you know, with every update, that character is getting softened. Mm -hmm. And now when you go, like, let's say you drive the 1.5 liter and you can see that that doesn't have the same character personality of the Mm -hmm. 1.2. That is very clearly a single mode kind of engine. It will do its task, Mm -hmm. right? So would I translate the 1.2 to the 1.5? Uh, I can't. I mean, I wouldn't. I'm glad I haven't, right? I, we took it as a separate engine and said, let's see what this is like. Mm. And with mild hybrid tech and all of that, it, it's nice as a great workhorse, but does it have the personality of the 1.2? Mm. No, it doesn't. Yeah, It just doesn't. So your rule number one is go get a test ride and get a sense of it. How do you, what's the next step after that? I think what I like to do is to connect the dots, which is why I enjoy the spec sheet, Mm. right? So it gives me an idea of what it is supposed to be Mm. or what they would like it to be and then see what it feels like. So essentially a spec sheet as a promise and then the test drive as a check as to whether it's delivering that promise or under or over delivering on that promise. Yeah, yeah. So like think about it from from car standpoint, right? Uh, You can look at a car's weight and say that, oh, this is heavy or light. But does that really, can you tell that while you're driving? You could. Uh, Motoring will shortly start selling backpack straps that will carry tons of uh, weight. And then you can attach it to any car or bike you think is too heavy and try carrying it or and seeing if it actually works out for you or not. Yeah. (laughs) No. So what I mean is like how a car feels like to drive is down to how the steering is calibrated, how the brakes are, what the geometry is again for the sh- I mean for the steering and yeah. the tires, all of that, right? You can't look at that and say, oh, this is going to be great to drive or not, yeah, right? You can't. It's going to be down to what it finally everything comes together and how it works, right? So, and then motorcycles. I think this is we've looked at spec sheets where the wheelbase is too long, and you're like, oh my god, this is not going to be a great, you know, great handler. And then boom, right? I think the 790 Duke is a great example of that huge wheelbase, but. But their weight matters, no? No, I'm talking about wheelbase in this Yeah, but weight matters in motorcycles. Of course. How will you lift it off the side stand otherwise? Yeah. And when you drop it, you have to pick it up. Don't forget. When you drop it, somebody else can pick it up. We're in India. Where are you ever so alone that you have to lift your own motorcycle up? You know how when we drop a motorcycle in India, everybody runs to your help, right? Except in a few situations. I remember I was making a U-turn on the Multistrada V4, not mine. Mm -hmm. The test bike when we had gone off-roading near uh, Pauna, I think. Mm. And there was an old man sitting having tea and I just come out to check something and I was going back to where all the mm. people were. So I was mm. alone except mm. for the old man. And duly in the middle of the U-turn, I dropped the bike. Mm. Which is a good thing because it told me that this bike is not very easy to damage because it took no damage from that mm. leg drop. Mm. And it wasn't a 0 kmph drop, no, it was 2 kmph. It was moving forward when it went over. Mm. And the old man, imagine this, huh? he's a rural old man sitting having his morning cup of tea at a dhaba next to the lake or whatever. And he watches that giant motorcycle and his, his eyes been on it for a while and then the motorcycle starts to go over. And he's like, then the motorcycle's on the ground. I'm standing next to it. He didn't move a muscle. Okay. It took, I think somebody at the base noticing that the multi hadn't come back and somebody passing by to stop and help me lift it up because it would, it was below negative as it were. Oh. Like how a GS sits on its engine so it's positive and you can lift the rest of it. It actually fallen onto the, uh, like an off camber slope. So the front was low and the tires were high. Very, very difficult to lift it out of there alone. So I couldn't manage it and then I had help. But then I was trying to remember, even in Ladakh, Hmm. where there is very low population density, right? If you drop a motorcycle and you can't lift it by yourself for whatever reason, lack of technique or It's strength, magic. You just wait. <laughs> Eventually somebody shows up and helps it's you. It's like one of the rules of life. If you drop a motorcycle, somebody will appear. Yeah. <laughs> or, or if you're setting up a frame, when you're filming yeah. something, it'll be empty. Yeah. And the moment the DOP goes or the director goes, okay, now we are ready. Are we ready to roll? And then wow, <laughs> the traffic has appeared and won't stop, right? So yeah, so first, it's okay. Yeah. Go take a test drive. My general recommendation, and this is very hard to implement because most people are already past that stage. Mm. My recommendation is if you're going to go for a test ride, I don't really want you to see the reviews before that. Mm. I want you to go and experience the feelings that you had. Mm. Get a sense of what appeals to you and what doesn't appeal to you because it's easy to get colored by the impressions of the people you're watching, right? If you watch my reviews 
I have a very clear agenda saying I like sportier motorcycles. I like lighter motorcycles. I like excited motorcycles. And I don't always want a very well-rounded blend of abilities. I would rather have one or two things that are exceptionally good than five things which are all okay. Mm. This is my preference of motorcycling. Mm. And if you see the kind of motorcycles I buy, the motorcycles that really upset me are at a very high order of everything is okay. Right. But a motorcycle that says, okay, everything works, but there are three flaws. Mm. But one thing stands out is my kind of motorcycle, right? Right. Maybe that's not who you are and that's not how you see your machines. And therefore, why should I color your vision? That's a great example because for me as well, why driving is, driving, riding is so important. Suspension. How can you can translate what a suspension does on a spec sheet? Aside from saying, hey, it's got wheels, it's got tires, it's got springs and dampers mm. and they're there, right? You can say it's electronic or this and that. But how does it work? How does it work where you live, how you ride? You cannot... You cannot convey that through a spec mm. sheet. It can suggest what it could be like, but does it? And that is such an important part of having a vehicle, how much you enjoy it mm. and what it will do for you, right? And you can't do it any other way but to get in and drive and ride. Yeah, and the amount of preconceptions. It's like I put TVS uh, Eurogrip Pro Talk Extreme, which mm. is an enormous name for a tire, but ties in very well with the TVS Apache RTR 164V. Mm. But I put those tires on my bike, on the on this KTM, They're those tires in fact. And uh, the first set of comments I got when I put that out on Insta saying, this is the tires I'm running. Mm. I moved from H1s to these. Eurogrip on a KTM? Now Eurogrip changed everything about how they do when their tires went racing and these are race developed tires and they're called Remoras on TVSs, which we've ridden. So we know that the label Eurogrip on its own is misleading because they used to represent a mileage oriented tire. Hmm. That's not who they are anymore. Hmm. They still do make those, but their top of the line radials are top of the line radials. They have very, very good tires. Right. And similarly, we've seen big brands, which when they, I mean, you'd assume that because it's a big brand and you're buying a tire, it'll be fantastic, but that's not always the case. Pirelli Phantom. Sport comp. Yeah. <laughs> the Pirelli Phantom Sport Comp, yes. Yeah, they are good. so good, those tires, that when there was a supply chain issue and they were replaced by Seats, people celebrated. It got better. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> those tires have always been. Uh... Okay, let's see if you guys are really paying attention. If you can, if you can tell us what bikes we are talking about right now, there are two yeah. bikes that yeah. ran this tire. And then there was a supply chain issue and it moved to CS and everything got better. Tell us which bikes these are in the comments. <laughs> this is just a joke, okay? This is not serious and this is not to drive engagement. Don't do it if, yeah, if you yeah. think this joke is not worth it. Okay. The other side of it, I think, is that spec sheets can misinform you in some ways. Right? A spec sheet does work at the level of does it have ABS or not? Doesn't it not have ABS? But how crude was the KTM's ABS, for example, when it came out? How bad is the quick shifter on the KTM now? Hmm. The spec sheet doesn't capture that at all. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, relatively speaking, my Tono, which is obviously like a world more expensive, has a very rudimentary quick shifter, not even an auto blipper. Hmm. Hmm. But it's miles better than this KTM thing. Yeah. Right. And uh, there are these small feel nuances. And I think the point I want to make is you're buying machines for the feeling. You're not buying it for the specification, which is why my actual famous statement is you ride your motorcycle, not its spec sheet. Oh, I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so don't ride your spec sheet. Don't keyboard race the crap out of your spec sheets because it doesn't matter. Hmm. At the end of the day, the feeling matters. And like we've said in this discussion itself, right? There is a pedestrian Maruti 1.2 liter, which is giving him such strong feeling. There's a one liter Ford, which promised the world and failed to. Uh, there is a 45 BHP Duke in this discussion and a basic TVS Raider in this discussion to all raising feelings. It's true for scooters too. When I rode the Suzuki Access for the first time, the first one. Absolutely. I thought it was a firecracker. It was uh, when, when you crested a speed breaker and got off the other side and if you came on the throttle at the right, it would spin up all the way down the speed breaker before it remi reminded you saying, I'm a family scooter and then it sort of calm itself down, right? So much fun. Absolutely. I don't think, see, uh, again, the spec sheet angle is, like we said, it's a suggestion, right? What it actually translates to is the combination of how well it does things, what kind of uh, aspects cannot be communicated by 
buy a spec sheet. So like you're talking about the first gen Duke, I think that buzziness is something that you do enjoy, hmm. right? It gives you a sense of aggression, anger. Like you like, you like, I think he likes angry motorcycles. The Ducati and this are pretty angry that way. Yeah, I do. Right? So he likes those kind of motorcycles and that's not something that you can communicate via spec sheet. Hmm. How well things, now you're talking about ABS and the quick shifter in cars. I think the one thing which has become so important for people uh, is the infotainment system. And you think that everybody's got it nailed down, right? But no, it's not. Only Zontes, I think, has nailed down. <laughs> <laughs> it tilts also. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, getting that experience right is something that until you interact, mm. right, in all its forms now, in more ways in a car, fewer ways in a motorcycle, but more uh, direct in that sense. So all those things are the pieces that will finally connect together to let you know that it's working or not for you, mm. right? And I'm not saying that something that is not the quickest um, or is slow and maybe boring for me won't work for you. That is exact. And I learned this the hard way. Like I remember there was this neighbor of mine and he called me for car advice, of course. And um, I was like, uh, you know, you should get this hatch and don't buy this hatch. And next thing I know, he's gone and bought, it was the Chevy Yuba, right? And I was like, dude, that's the one car I said, don't buy. He's like, but I'm six foot, three inches tall. That's mm -hmm. the one hatch that accommodates me, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wrong in giving him that advice. I did not get his mm -hmm. problem clear enough, mm -hmm. right? And it's not possible, I think, for us to get everybody's perspective in. So which is why it's really important for you to be able to look at the spec sheet, see what it could mean, and then draw your own references from your experiences. Yeah, and then use the road test that you see online. The bloggers, bloggers, but whoever you're following, whoever you trust mm -hmm. is fine. Follow their advice to validate your opinion because they might have a larger database than them. I wouldn't say just validate, but kind of broaden their horizons. Like there could be something that, yeah. you know. Uh, and and they might bring up stuff that you haven't thought of. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so use it for that, but not as a sort of like a gun to your head where you saw uh, our test, for example, the Hunter Ronin test. Right. And we said don't buy either hmm. because we don't think they're good enough as what they're supposed to be. Yeah. doesn't mean you can't buy one. Yeah. It means our perspective, which remember, me and Singhi have road tested cars for and motorcycles for 20 years between us. We have 40 years of experience of riding, testing, driving, long distances, everything for hours and hours and hours. Mm. What this means is my database of what is possible, what is happening and what failed is a much bigger database than yours. If you don't have the skill level, the experience level or the mm. inclination to unlock those fringes of the experience, hmm. it shouldn't matter to you at all. Hmm. Like in, in the Yuva case that you gave, for example, we've driven cars, you're five foot six, he's six foot three. His world is very different from yours where his ergonomics are a real definite challenge because he's very far away from the Indian median yeah. height, right? And he made a good decision, I think. He went out, he sat in the cars and figured out that Singhi's advice was for that car. Right. But I don't even fit into that physically, so that's that. Correct. Perfect. Used to have a guy called Sarthak uh, in my school uh, in Delhi. And Sarthak used to drive a Maruti 800 sitting in the rear seat. <laughs> he was so tall that he actually physically finally removed the front seat. No way. Yeah. So, and at that point, seat belts, airbags, all of this was not a conversation. Right? So, Sarthak was quite happy to be have like an empty driver's window. So, everyone would be like, Ooh, what's going on in that car? And then cars, Sarthak would be at the back driving. I think it was 6'7 or 6'8 or something like that. So, stupidly <sighs> tall. And so I asked him, how does your family drive the car? So he's like, I'm as tall as my dad. So he and his dad would drive this Maruti 800 sitting literally in the so back seat. it was seat. a two-seater. <laughs> it was a three-seater because that seat was still there. So mom might be able to sit in front. But they actually physically ejected the driver's seat out of that car. I'm mm. not saying it's the safest thing to do. And if you're super tall, this is not mm. the way to solve it. Yeah. But back in the day, the safety was a much less uh, intense conversation. So it was that was their solution to it. A low density also back then. Yeah, I mean... It's what they did. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, but that's how they solved that problem. Right. Okay. Then comes the next question of, if you go for a test ride or a drive and the dealer says, oh, I don't have a demo vehicle to show you what the vehicle is like. What, what do you think you should do next? I haven't been able to bring myself to buy or commit to something if 
I haven't been able to experience or be convinced by it. So that has always so if I haven't been able to drive or write something, then I I can't be interested in it, quite frankly, because until and unless that happens, there's no connection. Yeah, I have the exact same, obviously more vehement version of this. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you won't let me test ride, or oh, you don't have it, you don't deserve my money. Simple, <laughs> it's done. At yeah. that point, it's over. And I think it's okay to travel a distance to another dealership if they will give me a demo. I think it's okay to go to another city entirely if that's what it takes. Mm. And the reason why I think like that is not because I have so much money or time. It's a very simple thing. If I'm going to spend two, three, four, five, ten lakh rupees on a vehicle, mm. I think the spending the six, eight, ten thousand rupees to put in the effort to ensure that I am buying the right product. Right. Especially if I cannot continue to buy the product because I have just so much money to throw around. If I bought the wrong one six months later, I can take a thirty percent write off, mm. and then just replace it. Mm. I don't think that's possible for me to do. And I think this is something um, many of you may have already experienced, like when a new vehicle is launched. and uh, you've asked us for our opinions and we haven't driven it we've not shared those opinions because you know opinions can't be formed on the basis of just looking at a spec sheet or a set of photographs hmm. it has to take this time and effort that uh, goes into forming a judgment and when you're making a purchase i think it's all the more important that you put in that time and effort so whether it means waiting some time getting getting maybe the opinions from a few people that you really do trust mm. who understand you and your needs that helps that's that's a if that's the closest you can get to it so what do you do when a ev manufacturer startup vc funded shows you something there are stories floating about saying how nice this will be there's a massive spec sheet in play but they're 10 months from production or at least they claim to be 3 months and then it becomes 4 months and then ultimately the vehicle comes 10 months later by which time there's a 3 year wait list how do you process this I don't know how to process this question to be honest. <laughs> Because okay, fine. When you're at that early stage, I'm looking at it as an as a for me personally, uh, as an interesting peek into how they're doing things. Hmm. Right? It's it's again, it's a spec sheet version minus 20 or whatever you want to call it, right? Hmm. It's again an indication. Now the spec sheet itself is in beta. Yeah, the spec sheet <laughs> is in beta. So what that means at that point in time is just for me to be able to understand what direction they're going in mm-hmm. does the direction seem interesting what it is then is if it's very very exciting okay fantastic but will it translate to a production version question mark is it terrible if it's terrible then you need to ask some hard questions as to why is it terrible and do you think they can be fixed by the time in 10 but that's as a journalist as a customer i can when the hard questions are i can just say okay screw it i'll just walk away from this As a customer I don't think I can picture putting my money down for anything that I have not driven or ridden. That's just like a hard line. I just can't think about it. I'll be the last guy to buy it, no problem. Mm. I don't think I can see myself being the first guy buying something if I do not know the product and even even when it's a product and brand that you completely trust. Let let's talk about something that we did, right? Dreams, the film that we did. Mm. Uh, when we were planning that right we were not sure whether we'd get a uh, uh, 911 or a 718 which were basically the ice versions right and mm. we could have gotten a tycan right mm. and which is ev i was like i have not driven this i I'm and sure, therefore it can't be in the film yeah i'm sure it's it'll be great it's a porsche and therefore it will hold itself to a high standard but mm. i can't speak on its behalf if i haven't driven it yeah no absolutely i i i i'm as usual more vehement than you about this but uh, it's like uh, now i've been burnt by the ev world a little bit hmm. i totally get how good it's going to get we'll we'll categorize that as two wheeler ev world huh, huh? yeah huh. two wheeler ev world hmm. i know how good it will get but i also know that i have been burnt too many times right so for example xuv 700 hmm. i'm just going to call it the 700 hmm. So the 700, uh, the Scorpio N have long waiting periods, hmm. but we know who Mahindra is as an organization. They are an evolving organization. They are doing certain things a lot better than they've ever done before. But there are certain things that they continue to do as an organization. But there is a reasonable expectation of if I buy a new Mahindra, absolutely, which I will get delivery of in two years' time, I have these reasonable expectations hmm. by which I can manage my expectations. Hmm. Wow, that sentence had so much expectation in it, but. 
how do you do that with the let's take a name simple energy hmm. how do you do this with ultraviolet do you know who they are do you know what they stand for right their marketing will obviously tell us that they are the best there is that's what their marketing's job is they're doing their job it just happens to be looking at me and talking to me this is all aimed at you <laughs> who are these people when they don't have a reputation that precedes them as it were on what basis do you give them your trust so i tested simple energy scooter and it's very nice compared to the first versions of many evs that we've seen it was one of the better first versions after that the company just sort of went silent i know suhas and i know shreesh and all of these people and i think they're they're good people trying to do good work but they stopped communicating after that could they have said publicly saying there are delays mm. i think it would have helped their case mm. you would have given them credit for being honest but now that the scooters disappeared i am a little upset about the people who probably paid the money to simple energy to book those scooters based on my recommendation because now i think i was too excited and i recommended it too early and now my new policy is that if you're an ev manufacturer promising us something bring the production bike with the spec sheet and the vehicle in production form with a price with a clear launch date and then we'll talk about whether i want to ride it and feature it and recommend it right none of which are connected to each other but if it is a series production b series production beta pre production production unit from the first batch price will come in 3 months sorry right please give us time it's not that i don't like them hmm. it's that there are too many inconsistencies in this process for me to be able to give one of motoring c viewers a clear recommendation saying this is totally worth doing and i think it'll turn out well or it's just a total disaster waiting to happen so don't touch it so i uh, let's put some context on this like this is obviously in many ways when this happens uh, the companies are trying to get visibility mm-hmm. right publicity in that sense trying to get feedback through these early review processes and stuff like that um which is great for them right but i think for the end consumer not so great and i think uh, even in the car world when we look at it there are these teasers when something is supposed to launch you know starts two months before or maybe a few weeks before uh, where you see first a silhouette and then one little bit of this and that it's all a need to get your attention hmm. your attention right so sh- should you fall for it should you get built up with that hype? yeah I, i think you should totally fall for it because i think the best learning that will ever happen to you is not by listening to the motoring podcast mm-hmm. not on this connect it will happen if you make a mistake then you suffer its consequences and then you're like oh my god that's what the motoring guys were saying don't pay attention to the bs focus on what's really going to happen if that thing is still 3 months away is 3 months away so shumi is the one who's actually protecting you from making mistakes whereas if you think about it my belief is hey listen everybody's got to fall and learn and so yeah it's okay do your thing no matter how much i say it but but how angrily and how vehemently he says it because he genuinely doesn't want you to make that no mistake. no no please make mistakes <laughs> it's not true i'm telling no, no, make you. mistakes the short guys should really buy the tall bikes that i really want <laughs> because when 6 months later still haven't figured out how to ride them and you'll sell them off at 30% off i might then be able to afford them <laughs> right so uh, I mean think about it if the 890 adventure R was on sale here hmm. it's got a ridiculously tall saddle although hmm. I think it's a ridiculously capable motorcycle and yeah. it's ridiculous that KTM won't sell it to us huh. but I'm very happy to have people buy it right because it is stupidly tall hmm. and you can learn how to deal with it hmm. but most people won't make the effort hmm. and that's okay right because that means 6 months later 30% off huh. 890 adventure R before we wrap up I think I want to run a few quick questions sure um heaviest motorcycle ridden or oh, it will be some electra glide ultra classic type thing with everything on it uh was it as bad as you expected it to be no it never is i very very early on in my career figured out that we don't have to lift them up and mm-hmm. carry them around mm-hmm. they have wheels and they roll most uh powerful motorcycle anything most powerful anything will be the gt2 rs or something like that some 7800 horsepower or something like that Was incredible it, how demanding was it on a public road it's never demanding right how stupid can you be on a public road before you crash somebody else's car <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, so uh, did we drive fast yes were we told where 
on that route could we safely go fast yes was there an autobahn section with an unrestricted space yes uh, not in that car but did i do 300 somewhere on an unrestricted yes but if you're not going to be stupid about it then you don't need a lot of horsepower hmm. you remember the subscription thing that i said <laughs> tall seat right uh it'll be in the 900 920 zone on some off road bike somewhere wow it will be and was it uncomfortable yes did i immediately decide i will not put both my feet down yes and does it work really well it does yeah did i have both at least the other foot on the foot peg while the other one was on the ground not all the time uh, and did it bug you it did but i knew that this is natural so it was okay did you come away better from each one of those absolutely every motorcycle i ride makes me a better human being there's no getting away from that there was a car in that list as well but yeah okay dude the gt2 rs is a motorcycle okay <laughs> porsche would like you to believe that it's a car i promise you it does more motorcycle things than it does uh-huh. car things do you have do you, do you remember motorcycles that make brake noise as they roll along and you can hear it going and then you touch the brake and the noise gt2 rs that's what it does you can hear the brakes coming on inside the car it is like that how many seats are in a gt2 rs mm. two mm. how many average seats does a motorcycle on average get two I mean, you think about it. It's a motorcycle. Is the part to weight ratio not? I'm just not happy that there's a car that it, talks to you as much. <laughs> is the part to weight ratio not very similar to a motorcycle's part to weight ratio? It is. <laughs> does it have air conditioning? I don't think it does. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> Neither do most motorcycles. I did mean, it actually have a passenger seat? I'm not sure about that either. No, that it did because Aspi was there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yeah. So you've, I mean, you've really. F- dealt with some outliers yeah and dealing with them is not as big a deal as it seems to be it's as big a deal as you're willing to make out of it hmm. okay look let's say that your iq was say 1/3 of what it is hmm. and let's say that physically you were 1/3 as strong as you are but if i put a gun to your head and i say no no if you don't finish this task i will shoot you would you not finish hmm i just broke a barrier by putting bringing a gun into the room hmm. right I think all of you are capable of anything you want and mm. there is nothing stopping you especially not a spec sheet. Mm. All you have to do is say yeah I need to conquer that. Right. And you will. Right? You're riding an active around and you want to go to the Dakar tomorrow you will. Mm. From there to there is a journey that requires a certain amount of effort dedication and all of that bring it you'll go. Mm. You say no it's too much for me. Why well, you already gave up so you're never going. Mm. That's all it is. and i think the key thing i want to sign off with is that what is possible cannot be captured on the spec sheet and motorcycles cars there's a lot of emotion involved and no manufacturer i know like a hyundai spec sheet with 67 variants in it is a very complicated document the document captures nothing of the emotion of that vehicle hmm. it cannot it's not designed to do it and why are we buying vehicles they have some utility value but there's a big emotional component to it. So don't look at them. Look at what it's going to bring to your life. That's what it's about. Drum roll and disconnect.